Now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Daniel Pike directs the Climate Map Map Project, a nonprofit developing open access methods, data sets, and decision making tools for climate change response, with a particular focus on illuminating the pathways and possibilities for greenhouse gas removal and storage. Daniel will discuss the use of scientific roadmaps to improve coordination of scientific funding. Take it away, Daniel. Hey, hi, everybody. Welcome. It's great to be with you all today, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, my name is Daniel Pike. I'm the director of the Climate Map, or TCM for short. TCM is a nonprofit project. We're based in the US, but we have contributors and collaborators globally. And we're currently focused on catalyzing carbon removal via collaborative and systematic approaches to road mapping. In today's talk, I have three objectives. Uh, first, I want to help inform this audience about the need for carbon removal and potential options for achieving it. <clears throat> I want to warn you all about the significant commons and innovation chasm challenges that we see in the CDR field. And third, and perhaps most importantly, I, I want to galvanize this community to help address those challenges with all of the considerable tools that you have. So why do we need carbon dioxide removal <clears throat> at this juncture? Well, we're currently emitting about 55 billion tons of CO2 each year. Well, in context, the entire Amazon rainforest today stores approximately 200 billion tons. So that's equivalent to four years of emissions at current rates. If we want to limit warming below two degrees, which is widely accepted as an important goal, we need to both dramatically reduce our emissions and remove emissions from the air on top of that. In 20 to 30 years, carbon removal will be needed at industrial scale, perhaps at a scale similar in size to the major emitting industries today. The good news is that we have many options for doing carbon removal, including the ones laid out on, on this page, but also some others that aren't, aren't shown here. The stuff that humanity has done on the largest scale is on the left. <clears throat> it's largely photosynthesis and, and land-based work that's been done today, and most of it is forestry. These approaches are very valuable, but they are limited. <clears throat> They're limited by competing pressures on the land. And because forests can burn or be cut down or destroyed by pests, these approaches can also prove to be impermanent and reversible. The stuff that's less limited by land constraints and less prone to reversal is further to the right. For example, direct air capture with carbon storage and enhanced weathering and ocean alkaline, alkalinization approaches, <clears throat> which involve grinding up alkaline rocks, which then react with, with the air to fix the carbon. However, all the work on the right is micro scale today. For example, the largest and most advanced operation in direct air capture and mineralization is Project Orca in Iceland. And this is a picture of most of what the the site looks like. <clears throat> As project opened in September, it cost approximately 10 to 15 million US dollars to build, and it sequesters 4,000 tons of CO2 per year. That's a big achievement, but this is one millionth of what is needed approximately. So the CDR field is early in its development. How do we enable it to rapidly mature? <clears throat> Well, we learned from solar that maturation occurs in stages. It begins with core science and a tech push, and then it evolves as markets develop. <clears throat> There's a set of public goods and supporting elements that are needed throughout. And importantly, if you don't feed every piece of the chain, bottlenecks will develop and progress will slow down. Our challenge today is to move CDR through this process in 30 years, as opposed to the 70 years that solar required. Now, this is a massive challenge because the innovation chasm in CDR is profound. Now, we're talking about the development and deployment of integrated systems that are intensive in terms of the capital, the engineering, the hardware, 
and the infrastructure that they require. And this is exactly the type of work that neither the academic nor the market system is, is well set up to support. <clears throat> As again, this community is, is, is well aware. In addition, the public goods funding gaps are profound. The largest and most important of these is obviously the fact that the value of carbon removal is not priced in as a public good, despite years of dedicated advocacy around putting a price on carbon, we are nowhere near we sh where we should be on that. But even beyond that, there are a set of challenges where you know, we need public goods related to policy frameworks, protocols, standards for how you do this, the dissemination of knowledge, IP, investments in human capital, and so on. Our hypothesis is that a strategic approach to road mapping can help accelerate the CDR field. Specifically, we think road mapping done well can address the innovation chasm by surfacing frontier concepts from academia and translating them to people outside of academia, and also by accelerating the sort of um, integrated technology development and deployment that's needed. And second, we think it can address public goods funding gaps by identifying public goods of structural importance and then boosting funding for those goods. We've begun testing these hypotheses with proof of concept roadmaps for two of the areas that I mentioned earlier, direct air capture with carbon storage and in enhanced weathering. <clears throat> you know, we are definitely a work in progress as a project, but I would say that at this point, we have validated that we can extract um, valuable concepts from academia and also identify public goods. <clears throat> Let me just share a little bit about how we are, we are going about it right now. You know, we've developed a process, which again, it's a work in progress. We're iterating on it and we're on N equals two. Um, but as we go, we're, we're systematizing it as much as possible. <clears throat> Uh, it's highly collaborative, and it has the potential to generate comprehensive, multi-dimensional roadmaps for these spaces in, in a way that's never been done before. I'll just take five minutes to <clears throat> share some excerpts from some of these specific steps to give you a sense of what it looks like in practice. The first set of process steps, the ones across the top row here, are really about people and organization. <clears throat> As Adam Marblestone mentioned in his talk yesterday, <clears throat> the organizational structure that prevails in, in academia is, is really set up for um, individual exploration and discovery, <clears throat> which has you know, many attributes and is sometimes what's needed. Um, but sometimes there's a need for more team-based, focused models of organization or, or other alternative structures. <clears throat> The first thing that we are doing on the organizational front <clears throat> is we're pairing what I would call a um, customized SWAT team <laughs> with um, an academic research group that is specialized in the discipline. I spent a lot of my career in, in management consulting, um, and there are some elements of the management consulting model <clears throat> that we are bringing to bear here. Those include you know, a focus on hypothesis-driven thinking for decision-making, right? So starting with some view of, of what the main decisions and opportunities might be. <clears throat> the second is the application of um, MISI frameworks to make sure you're thinking uh, rigorously about options uh, and opportunities. <clears throat> the third is bringing together a team um, with diverse skill sets <clears throat> and harnessing the power of that team against a pretty fast paced project schedule and set of deadlines. And those are all elements that um, our core research team, the four people over here on the left, um, are, are organized around. And you'll also see that the team's diverse, where we have people with hard science training, but also backgrounds in, in business. Um, and, and social science. 
<clears throat> so we're taking that, that SWAT team and organizational model, and then we're pairing it with the, with the research groups. In, in this particular case, um, we have a six-person research group from the Research Center for Carbon Solutions at Harriet Watt University. And this is a group that has deep expertise um, in direct air capture and carbon storage, and in particular in techno-economic analysis, process design, and, and material science. You'll see that their team is also diverse in terms of the uh, uh, seniority um, in, in particular, um, and also in terms of their, their research interests and, and backgrounds. Having paired up like this, there's a sort of creative tension that we see emerge where um, we're combining the fast-paced, project-based, um, consulting-inspired model with the processes and um, practices in, in academia. Um, and what we found so far is that something pretty magical and important happens when you have that creative tension working well. Um, obviously, we are able to go deeper and uncover more um, by working with, with these excellent researchers than we would be if, if we were working independently. <clears throat> um, but also by collaborating in a, um, in a process and against a timeline that is much faster um, and structurally different to what the researchers are typically working against, um, we like to think that we um, engage them in a way that is exciting and uh, opens up new possibilities. <clears throat> So that's an important first piece. A second piece <clears throat> is broadening the engagement outside of our uh, collaborative team through the use of um, ad advisory groups. <clears throat> and here what's, what's important is to diversify the range of expertise and um, perspectives um, beyond that that our 10 team members are bringing to the table. And so we've des deliberately designed an advisory board that is um, diverse across sectors, um, but also, also geographies. The second row of these process steps are less about people and more about the process itself and the steps we go through. Um, so I'll take a second here to just illustrate what that looks like in practice. <clears throat> One of the first steps there is a comprehensive MISI categorization and exploration of uh, possibilities, right? And so within direct air capture, um, we went back to first principles and really pushed hard to figure out what is, what is actually possible there. And we, um, we've identified 10 different pathways, <clears throat> some of which rely on the absorption and absorption based techniques, which are, um, which are the ones used in the pilot projects that have been established today. But we also have identified approaches that are more at the cutting edge um, related to uh, membrane-based se separation and also cryogenic separation, um, purely the use of, the use of temperature. <clears throat> so the first step at the process level is to do this rigorous categorization. And then for each of these different process steps within direct air capture, we map out the process steps uh, and make it visual, <clears throat> both for ourselves and for our, for our audiences. And you know, I won't go into the full detail that's on, that's on this slide, but <clears throat> um, when you do this process mapping and visualization for multiple pathways at the same time, uh, it, it's highly illuminating in terms of what is actually going to be involved or required to deploy these different techniques. And then, of course, what the constraints, bottlenecks to development and deployment might be in, in practice. And it's only when you have a clear line of sight on what the constraints and bottlenecks are that you can really begin to think about um, innovation and about workarounds and ways to really transform a, a domain. The other thing I want to point out is that within direct air capture and carbon storage, you have both direct air capture 
options, and then you have storage options. So here, uh, I'm just laying out the options, uh, the categorization that we've done for storage. And the point I want to make here is that having identified 10 different options for direct air capture and more than 10 options for carbon storage, you multiply the 10 <clears throat> capture options by the 10 storage options, you already have 100 different pathways um, to explore here. Um, so that shows you some of the power of applying this MISI-based um, uh, exploration categorization model. Once we've worked through some of those elements of, of the process, we then <clears throat> go into more of a synthesis mode um, where we're focused on extracting the main um, constraints and bottlenecks that need to be overcome and then the main areas of opportunity for innovation um, and priority initiatives. <clears throat> I'm going to switch from direct air capture and carbon storage back to our um, the other vertical that we've looked at, which is enhanced weathering, and <clears throat> just share some of the um, some some of the frontier concepts that we were able to sort of surface and extract from academia, and hope to share with uh, with the world beyond academia. They fall into three main buckets, really, and and, and the first set of frontier concepts really is, is around hybrid deployment of enhanced weathering with other CDR techniques. Again, just as rough context, you know, enhanced weathering essentially involves grinding up alkaline rocks and minerals um, and spreading them in different locations or setting them up in different locations to interact with the carbon in the air and, and fix it. Um, and to date, most of the deployment of this technique has been pure play. In other words, people are focused on spreading these rocks on um, coasts or in the ocean or occasionally um, in more sort of industrial type environments. <clears throat> but the opportunities for hybrid deployment are, are rich and they involve essentially co-deploying um, these ground up rocks with forestry solutions um, in more agricultural contexts and alongside biochar and soil carbon. Um, and then deploying them with uh, bioenergy approaches to carbon capture or, um, sorry, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage or with uh, the direct air capture, um, both of which are approaches where you end up with a stream of carbon that comes off and can then be reacted with the rocks. So there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, then there's a whole area of opportunity around process optimization, um, the use of novel feedstocks, um, enhancing the efficiency and speed of, of the mineralization reactions um, through, through process design, um, and then innovation around <clears throat> the byproducts uh, that come out of weathering processes, some of which could be commercially valuable, and also managing the contaminants which can come out of these processes and need to be managed. And finally, uh, the third point area where there's a lot of frontier concepts that deserve to be looked at um, and further developed is <clears throat> it's around the use of catalysts. Um, there are biological, chemical, and physical catalysts that have been um, conceptualized, put forward by, by academics. Some of, the, some of the possibilities around the applications of biotechnology and synthetic biology to catalyze these reactions is, you know, some of those are incredibly exciting. Um, and there's a group of group of researchers at MIT who are particularly interested in that. Um, <clears throat> um, but again, a lot of these ideas are conceptual at this stage and um, merit further investigation. When it comes to our second objective of, you know, surfacing important um, important public goods that are needed, structurally important, <clears throat> the way we synthesized our, our key findings for enhanced weathering is by focusing first on the main gaps and bottlenecks that will need to be addressed if we're going to reach large scale deployment. <clears throat> and we've organized those gaps and bottlenecks across six categories. Um, in the demand for CDR, solutions that meet the demand, social license, which is highlighted here, 
supply chains, human capital, and infrastructure. And I think here basically is that bottlenecks, bottlenecks in the emergence of a mature industry can emerge in any of these six areas. In other words, you might have a high price on carbon and strong demand. You may have a set of solutions that have been developed and well-tested, but if the social license isn't there, then deployment is going to get held back. <clears throat> so we see gaps in each of these six areas. Um, we try to identify which of those gaps and bottlenecks need to be addressed first. I've highlighted here the social license category um, because it's one of the areas we really expect to see bottlenecks emerge um, most quickly. <clears throat> Sticking with that example of, of social license, the question obviously then becomes, okay, if we see um, a set of bottlenecks emerging in social license, what, what can we do to uh, preempt that, to address it? What are the public goods in particular that could be needed? Um, so here we have a set of priority initiatives. We believe they are worth consideration. Um, a lot of them are public goods. I won't go through each of them in detail, but you know, multi-stakeholder standard setting for these projects, um, the identification or, or the, the development and proliferation of knowledge-based tools to help people identify sites, um, transformations in permitting and regulation regimes, broader public education. All of these are public goods, um, which will be critically important to the deployment of enhanced weathering, which itself will be critically important to whether we achieve climate stability or not. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we have conducted these proof of concept roadmaps that in our view validate two of our four sub hypotheses Next, we plan to turn our insights into action. So our focus, our focus for the coming year is to see whether we can take the insights that come out of this process um, that we're running and actually catalyze some action with it. So can we, can we accelerate technology development and deployment? Um, can we get the right stakeholders around the table um, to help grease the tracks for projects that require, you know, not just startups, but engagement from government and investors, um, nonprofits, and so on. <clears throat> Similarly, can we boost funding for public goods that we've identified? Can we get a set of philanthropists um, and government actors around the table and get some of these public goods funded? I will say that the approach we're planning to take um, to achieving those goals right now is it's, 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 probably, it's probably likely to be quite conventional from a nonprofit standpoint in that um, we expect to integrate our project with a larger nonprofit, which has a set of relationships with um, philanthropists, corporations, and other stakeholders. We expect to um, try and convince <laughs> uh, philanthropists and other stakeholders to take action on these projects. Um, all of which are fairly classic conventional strategies for a nonprofit. However, there's a set of things that we would love to test um, if we were you know, fully unconstrained, um, things that this community could absolutely um, play a really vital role in, in achieving. You know, we'd love to make our approach to identifying the, these priority initiatives or OKRs as, uh, in your parlance um, we'd love to make our approach to identifying them more networked, right? Get input from more people, maybe experiment with alternative structures for arbitrating the, the OKRs. We'd love to expand the audience that acts on the OKRs, right? Especially for public goods. Uh, and we'd love to reward people better, right? Figure out how we can get more people contributing knowledge and innovation opportunities to the commons, get more people shaping effective OKRs in this context, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, reward people for achieving the OKRs, especially the public goods. Thanks so much.